Hello and welcome to Flip Teach. And in this session we're going to be looking at the biomechanical principles. So that's Newton's laws of motion and force. So why do we need to know these in sport? Well it helps us analyse performance, maximise movement and also reduce injury. So a lot of people get a little bit nervous about biomechanics but I, I, I don't want you to panic. We're going to walk through it nice and easily and we're going to start with the basics and then give some practical applications as well. All right, so the three laws of motion. The first one is the law of inertia. So everything will stay in a particular state of rest or uniform velocity unless a force acts upon it, and that's an external force. So something, let's say like a large weight, that's going to stay where it is in a state of inertia unless another force acts upon it. Okay, that's fine. But now let's link this to sport. What about this ball? So if I threw this ball in space, what would happen to it? Well, it would just carry on in the same velocity until another force acts upon it. But because there's no gravity, it's probably going to keep going. So if we throw a ball on Earth, which is a little bit more realistic, it's going to have a different flight path. So what are the forces that are impacting on that? And it's gravity and air resistance as well as mass. So let's have a look at that. So what we're seeing first of all is that the ball is in a state of inertia until another force acts upon it. So as he's holding the ball, all the forces are equal and therefore it's going to stay where it is. Okay, so as the ball flies through the air, the forces that are acting upon it are its mass, also the uh, air resistance and gravity. Okay, so the second law of motion is the law of acceleration. So a body's rate of change is proportional to the size of the force that you apply to it. So let's think about that in a practical sense. If we have, let's say, this small basketball and we throw that with X amount of force, it'll probably go quite a long way. But if we throw this large ball with the same amount of force, it won't go as far. So because the ball is larger, he's going to have to apply more force to it to get it to accelerate at the same rate as the previous shot that he made, which is going to be a lot harder to do, so he's going to have to increase the amount of force he's going to apply. All right, so if we think of that in this situation, the smaller person is going to have to use significantly more force to move the larger person than vice versa. That kind of makes sense, but that's one of the laws that Newton states is that it's in relation to the amount of acceleration. So let's use this bat here. If we hit that ball with X amount of force, it will maybe produce 25 meters per second of acceleration. But if we hit it with more force than a larger bat, it may increase the amount of meters per second. So therefore, the rate of change is proportional to the force that's applied. Okay. So Newton's third law, and this is one most of you will have probably heard of, for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. And it sometimes gets confused, but let's just have a look at this. So think about a force that's being pushed down onto the diving board, and let's say, for example, that's our athlete. So as you stand on the board, you push down as soon as the buzzer goes onto the board. Now, because there is an equal and opposite reactive force, this length then allows us to have motion in the direction of the second arrow. So the blocks are providing an equal and opposite reactive force and therefore we have motion in that direction. Now um, there's another type of force as well. Let's say if we were running on sand, obviously the sand is just going to push away under our foot and this is where some people get confused. So what we try and do is increase the amount of grip that we've got, don't we? Okay, let's have a look at that. So initially there's no friction, so therefore his foot goes backwards. But you can see what the athlete does. He applies some, um, some sweat to the surface and therefore that increases the friction force. So the types of force there is the ground reaction force, which is our normal force. But then what we've also seen there is the friction force. So increasing the amount of friction has actually aided the movement. So that's why I don't want you to get confused with the equal and opposite reaction because we're introducing a new force there. All right, so let's look at stability then. So stability is our ability to stay in a state of inertia really, isn't it? How stable we are. So what is it that's making this person so stable? 
and it's very simple things it's the size of them that's the first thing so we can say that they're mass but it's also how that mass is distributed that we need to look at so if you've got a wide base of support in other words your feet are wide apart you're going to be more stable that makes sense a low center of mass as well okay so what is center of mass well it's it's where an object is balanced in all directions you could usually sort of roughly say your middle but it's going to vary from different people so for this big fella here we could probably say it's about there but for the little guy we'll probably say it's a little bit higher because he's got more of his mass up top and there's also the line of gravity if you have your center of mass and a line directly down in between the base of support that again is going to make you more stable so what we need to do then is use that knowledge and think of a sporting example so let's have our rugby player why do they crouch down when they run so probably one of the reasons that they want to be more stable but don't forget this don't just use rugby as an example of being stable because if somebody's doing a, a conversion kick then they need to be uh, you know unstable so use a skill example and not a sports name okay so what about if someone wants to be unstable in sport where would you think you would need that all right good yeah so diving would be a really really good example so what we do is then we will reverse what we had before. So instead of a low center of mass, we have a high center of mass. We have a narrow base of support, and this makes us unstable. But that, in turn, allows us to form greater movements. So spins and rotations in, in relation to athletics, for example. Sorry, even gymnastics, that'd be a better one, wouldn't it? Okay, so here, let's look at Newton's laws in relation to a sporting application. So let's say we've got Johnny here on the blocks ready to, to start. So what one of the laws could we apply first of all? That's right, and it would be a state of inertia, wouldn't it? Because the person is in a state of inertia, their body is at rest until another force is going to act upon it. So that's exactly what we're going to have there. We also have the law of acceleration. So this will be proportional to the force that's applied. So the greater the amount of force that's um, pushed into the blocks, the greater the acceleration is going to be, isn't it? And then our third law, the greater the amount of force that's applied to the blocks, the greater the resultant force or the reaction force. And therefore, we're going to have the equal and opposite force applied in that there. So that gives you each one of the laws applied to a sporting example, which is obviously going to be really, really important for your exam questions. So do make note of those and you can add further detail if you need to. Okay. So what we've covered is each one of the laws of Newton. We've also looked at stability and instability and how they're potentially going to be used in sports as well. Okay, thanks for using FlipTeach.